Desert and the great American Southwest. I bid you all good evening, good morning, good afternoon, whatever the case may be, in whatever time zone you reside in, each and every one of them covered like a blanket by this program, Midnight in the Desert. I'm Art Bell. It is grand to be here tonight. Dennis McKenna is going to be my guest, and it's going to be a kick butt show. We have rules here, only two of them during the week. <laughs> no bad language, and only one call per show. That's it. All right, little bragging, I guess. This is kind of interest. Actually, a lot of bragging. Two stories. Talkstream Live. Uh, they monitor uh, all the talk shows uh, on the net. Released its third quarter 2015 ratings and ranks for the most streamed national radio talk shows. Michael Savage uh, continues to dominate digital space, reaching new heights with a 27 share, his highest ever. Savage takes the top spot once again, further extending his number one streak. Congratulations, uh, Mr. Savage, with high uh, margins all over all other competitors, followed by Rush, Laura Ingram, Mark Levin, and uh, Glenn Beck. Then it goes on, Art Bell returned to talk radio with Midnight in the Desert as predicted for his first rating period lands right among the top 25. TalkStream's uh, third quarter 2015 sampling size report exceeds 1.6 million, a 14% increase in total listening over the last quarter. So we didn't slaughter the top 25, but that we are on there at all is absolutely amazing considering we just began. That's one item. And the other is the headline story on the Huffington Post science page. Go to the Huffington Post, and the headline you're going to see is, Scenario that opens, quote, the day after tomorrow, and quote, actually, not that far-fetched, according to research. The 2004 blockbuster movie, The Day After Tomorrow, is all about the disastrous effect of uh, the collapse of a massive temperature-driven ocean circulation system. Although the system known as the Atlantic um, Circulation System is real, researchers said at the time that the movie wasn't based in facts, right? Actually, NBC clobbered Whitley and myself and other, uh, uh, many other media clobbered us as well. But according to research I'm going on now, published last week by the journal Nature Scientific Reports, the effects dreamed up in the movie may actually be more possible than initially thought. Now, I could go on, and I, I will a little. The AMOC helps warn Euro warm Europe and uh, the East Coast by bringing Caribbean waters northward, and shifting cooler waters south. Should the AMOC collapse, especially in light of the broader impacts of global climate change, this report finds that parts of the Earth would actually cool for a period of 15 to 20 years, very much like in the movie. Uh, the basic scenario of AMOC as a result of global warming is not completely out of the blue or unthinkable. Uh, they go on to say, and, and so on and so on. So if you want to read about it, uh, once again, when Whitley and I wrote the book, The Coming Global Superstorm, that became The Day After Tomorrow, we, we went on NBC and they made fun of us, and I got a couple of jabs back, as I recall, and then later a really good one. <laughs> But, I mean, we got clobbered, absolutely got clobbered. So um, so there you have it. Uh, it seems as though, well, frankly, na-na-na-na-na-na. Um, nah. Sorry, I shouldn't have done that. Um, now, next item, the Martian. Um, our family went uh, into Las Vegas 
this uh, this weekend, in fact, yesterday, uh, and saw The Martian. Now, in my opinion, The Martian rates as the best movie of the year, though the year is clearly not done, at least the best movie thus far, and I mean in every category. The CGI was flawless, but that's not the reason to go see The Martian. The reason to go see it is the story. Oh, my God, the story, the acting, the scientific realism, it was gripping, it was amazing, and I might also like to add they used my bumper music throughout. I almost fell off the seat when Abba came on. (laughs) Amazing. So if you don't do anything else and you don't go to any other movie this year, Go to the Martian. It is, it's simply out of this world in, in more, more ways than one. Sorry about that. Also at artbell.com, if Keith got it up, and I trust he did, somebody sent me a ghost photograph from Mackinac Island up in, uh, uh, the northern part of the world. Actually, that island is kind of special to me. I know you know it is because of the movie Somewhere in Time, which I absolutely have always loved. In fact, I went up to the island in a private jet. It was pretty cool. Matter of fact, I'm a ham operator, and I was talking to hams all the way from the private jet, something you cannot do in commercial aircraft yet. They'll finally figure out hams are not going to bring down planes. It's bad guys. Okay, uh, just a couple of other items, and then onward. Evidence is mounting that the El Nino ocean warming phenomenon in the Pacific is going to spawn a very, very rainy winter in California now. Scientists are saying they are 95% certain it's going to happen. Now, they say this is as close as you can get to a sure thing. Now, they're calling it too big... <laughs> Too big to fail. Um, So there you have science for you, too big to fail. Now, it wouldn't all be good, of course, uh, because of the deforestation, because of the extended drought, there will be mudslides. I jokingly said the mudslides will put out the fires. Europe's uh, climate chief has acknowledged now for the first time that climate pledges made by national governments ahead of a major U.N. conference fall uh, far short of meeting the 3.6 degree Fahrenheit uh, limit. In fact, uh, what they're saying is we're going to go up by 5.4 degrees, and that's enough. So ocean levels, they say, will climb. We could have, well... As the the book said, we could have a big freeze. This climate change is clearly real. Coming up in a moment, Dr. Dennis McKenna's research. You know, before I even say this, I want to say, uh, when I put up the fact that uh, Dr. McKenna was going to be on tonight, there are a number of people who said, oh, a drug show. Well, I'm not going to watch, I'm not going to listen to that, it's a drug show couple people anyway. And, um, yes, in a sense, uh, it will. Ab- it certainly is going to be about drugs. But I want to say something. It's not a go-do drug show. It's we're, That's not what we're doing here. Drugs are part of the human experience. How strongly can I put this? What do we do on this program? We explore questions, some of them the biggest in the world, like what comes next. And if there's anything out there beyond our physical, material existence, what greater questions can there be in the world? Everybody does drugs. Virtually everybody, right? Coffee is a drug, and I'm hooked. Cigarettes are a drug, and I was hooked. Well, I'm still hooked on nicotine. So, <laughs> alcohol, well, that's a big drug. Drugs are part of human life. But the drugs we're going to talk about here 
are drugs that affect the human psyche, the human existence. And so they go to the very questions that we ask on this program. They are central to the questions, or may be, let me qualify that, may be central to the questions that we ask and study on this program. Anyway, Dr. Dennis McKenna, Terrence's brother, the late Terrence McKenna, uh, Dr. Uh, Dennis McKenna's research has focused on the interdisciplinary study of Amazonian ethnopharmacology and plant hallucinogens. He has conducted extensive ethnobotanical field work in the Peruvian, Colombian, and Brazilian Amazon. His doctoral research at the University of British Columbia in 1984 focused on the ethnopharmacology of ayahuasca and ukiha. We'll find out about that. Two tryptamine based hallucinogens used by indigenous peoples in the northwest Amazon. He is a founding board member of the Hefter Research Institute, was a key organizer and participant in the Alaska Project, uh, the first biomedical investigation of ayahuasca used in the UDV, a Brazilian religious group. He is currently assistant professor in the Center for Spirituality and Healing at the University of Minnesota. He has written a book called Brotherhood of the Screaming Abyss, My Life with Terrence McKenna, his brother. Uh, welcome to the program, Dennis. Hello, Dennis. Well, that's... Uh... Here I am. Oh, there you are. I have it muted, sorry. You had it muted, okay. I have it muted. Okay. Good to be here, Art. Thank you for having me back. Um, well, I'm glad to have you back. Um, very thankful to have you back. And let us begin with your book. I, I absolutely love the title, Brotherhood of the Screaming Abyss, My Life with Terrence, <laughs> Terrence McKenna. Um, tell me about your book and why you decided to write it. Well, it's a complex question. Um, I felt that the time had come in my life to write this book. I had a side of the story, our story, that I wanted to tell, and I just thought the time was right, especially since it was written uh, in 2012, toward the end of 2012 is when it appeared. And as you know, that was a very important date for my brother and his time wave theory, so it was just it was partly a personal thing it was uh, it was a desire to tell my story i mean that's what it boiled down to and uh i was able to uh, do a successful kickstarter campaign so i i could create the time and the resources to write the book mm -hmm. and so and so it appeared okay it, uh, 18 months later. Okay. Um, and I did not do the break that I had promised I was going to do, which probably accounts for your not coming back in a timely way. So let me do that break. And by the way, they, they used this song, folks, in my movie, The Martian. I about fell out of my seat. Uh, they used a lot of the other music I use. And then toward the end of the movie, they used this song by ABBA. Take a walk on the wild side of midnight. From the Kingdom of Nye, this is Midnight in the Desert with Art Bell. Please call the show at 1-952-225-5278. That's 1-952-CALL-ART. Once again, here is uh, Dennis McKenna. Uh, welcome back, Dennis. Thank you. All right, so the title, though, Brotherhood of the Screaming Abyss. Um, how'd you come up with that? Where, where did that come from? Well, I don't know. It says book. Uh, what it says here at the bottom, book, Brotherhood of the Screaming Abyss, My Life with Terrence McKenna. Yes, that's right. Well, 
Uh, the title is uh, kind of tongue-in-cheek, uh, Art. In some ways, uh, when we were very young, when we were about 20, uh, we got into uh, some pretty uh, interesting uh, uh, delusional, maybe, or, or conceptual places <laughs> that uh, led us to traipse off to the Amazon in 1981 and uh, 1971 in search of this legendary drug, Ukuhe, and uh, the reasons behind that are more complex, but, but to, to the question, our band of explorers, it wasn't just Terence and myself, there were other people involved, but our band of, of, uh, of uh, people that went down there, we called ourselves the Brotherhood of the Screaming Abyss. Aha. Okay. Kind of ch- tongue in cheek in some ways, you know, because we knew we were looking for a a secret. We had this idea that somehow the, the tryptamine hallucinogens held a great secret, but we didn't really know what we were getting into. And as it turned out, subsequent events proved that we really didn't know what we were getting into. <laughs> but anyway, sort of, you know, it's good to keep a sense of humor as you get into these things. And being Irish, we had this. I, you know, this moniker, the Brotherhood of the Screaming Abyss. We were sure. sort of mocking ourselves, I guess, a bit. So that's that's where it came from. I think it, it could not be more fitting, actually. I thought so. Yeah, yeah. I mean, as it turned out, we, uh, you know, we were approaching an abyss of sorts, and we really had no idea what was in store for us down there in Colombia in 1971, um, and. I should mention, you know, I, I mean, I don't know how deep you want to get into that, but generally I usually avoid it because the story is so convoluted. Um, I wouldn't mind getting into it at all. Uh, you know, I would like to do now, this, now though. Now I tell people, read the book. Right. Right? Oh, well, I mean, okay. It's all in there. Well, Terrence, as you know, uh, had been interviewed by myself many times. Right, right. And uh, we were quite close, Dennis, and uh, nowhere near as close as you were with your brother. But I'm, I'm kind of curious. Uh, you have followed, to some degree, parallel courses, and to some degree, not parallel courses. And I, I wonder if you would, in, if you can enlarge on that thought. In other words, how, in what ways are you different than your brother was? Sure. Well, uh, again, if if you read the book, it goes into sort of, you know, how this alliance started really from our earliest childhood. I mean, we were both, you know, kind of weird kids and kind of nerdy. We were interested in science fiction and, and space travel and paranormal events and and you know just anything that was outlandish that was our that was uh that was fascinating to us you know and not unlike i suspect a lot of listeners to art bell they can often you know think back to their own childhood and interest in what you might call the obscure in the esoteric and you know that's really the thread that uh you know that was the thread of common interests between Terence and myself, we both, and he being the older, you know, kind of led in some ways. He was four years older, so he would get interested in things. And, and then, you know, it, it's kind of the little brother syndrome. Whatever your big <laughs> brother's doing, that's sure. interesting. Sure. You know, you want to be in on that, even though half the time he says, go away, you know, you're just a pest. <laughs> but I, but we sort of grew out of that. And then we realized that, you know, we both had mutual interests and, and both had something to contribute. And so, you know, we were good partners in this exploration of the bizarre. And, uh, when it, came to psychedelics, you know, psychedelics came up into the culture, and we clearly thought, you know, this is big news, and this is worth looking into, you know, something that can, uh, uh, you know, allegedly open these other dimensions. This was right up our alley, being being fed on science fiction. And and, that's what I'm trying to tell my audience. Uh, You know, that's what I'm trying to tell the audience. This is not a do-drug show. This is a show that goes to the very center of the questions that we deal with on this program. And there are many paths to uh, finding out what comes next or what is beyond, if anything, beyond the material. 
And right. if there are bigger questions in life, I, I don't know what they are. Well, exactly. I don't either. And, uh, you know, back in the 60s when we discovered these these substances, these medicines, uh, I thought it was, you know, the most significant discovery I've ever made. And what are we into at all? That was the 60s. So 50 years on, uh, my opinion hasn't really changed. You know, I think that psychedelics are damned interesting and uh, darned interesting, I guess I should say. No, that's fine. No, that's fine. Did you, <laughs> did you find that you and, and uh, Terrence had a different road or different approach to basically the same thing, or were you always sort of in lockstep? No, no, not at all. I mean, we we did have a different approach, and he was more of a philosopher and a, 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 a cultural commentator and a you know a brilliant mind. Oh yeah. Uh, but his approach was not really the science route, and I was more in the science route. You know, I, I took a scientific uh, interest in in studying these things. Uh, but always I was cognizant of how limited science is in terms of really understanding what these materials are and also, you know, by extension, understanding what consciousness is, what mind is, because yes. that's really what these things are. They're tools for exploring consciousness and uh, possibly trying to... Uh, you know, understand the relationship between the brain and the mind, you know. So in some ways, I think of psychedelics, they're really tools for neuroscience in a certain way. But they're also tools for, I guess you could say, phenomenology, people that are trying to understand, you know, what it is, what is it to be conscious. These are uh, tremendously useful tools. And, you know, in that respect. Now, you know, you can say, well, drugs, these are drugs, right? So, therefore, they're completely illegitimate. And what I would say to that is, uh, you know, that is a, there are drugs and there are drugs, right? Yes. For one thing, there are all kinds of drugs. As you pointed out earlier, coffee is a drug, sure. tea is a drug, all these things. So, the term, blanket term drugs is utterly meaningless. We have to say, what kind of drugs? And it so happens that the psychedelics are in a special class of drugs. They don't cause addiction. Uh, they're not particularly toxic, but they do really interesting things phenomenologically. And they, they don't... Uh, they don't really, I mean, although they're classified as drugs of abuse, what are, again, another meaningless term, but they don't necessarily ad, uh, invite uh, abuse <laughs> because... Okay, in the sense you know, that, to, that, that... To use that, them, you have to do a lot of processing to deal with, yes, uh, uh, to, with what they bring up. To use them in the... Uh, they have no relationship to the, the kind of hook that uh, heroin uh, or any other addictive substance like that... Uh, Right. Puts on you, that, right? That, those are totally different neural circuits. Psychedelics don't work on those circuits. They work on serotonin, which is, you know, another important neurotransmitter, but they don't have this, uh, in the pharmacologists call it reinforcing effect, meaning the more you take it, the more you want to take it. With psychedelics, it's quite the opposite. The more you take it, the more you wonder if, Am I going to be able to face it the next time? <laughs> you know? yes. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't invite you to leap off the cliff every other night or anything like that because, you know, you get into some fairly strange realms. Well, I mean, you went on to get a doctorate to study this, so clearly you did yeah. take the scientific approach. How does one go about doing research on drugs that the government says uh, you should be arrested for? Well, you know, surprisingly, there is a way to do that. Uh, it involves a lot of bureaucracy. Uh, uh, it involves usually working through major academic institutions. It involves, it helps if the, if the scientists uh, doing the, with the work and applying for the grants and so on are, you know, have excellent credentials in their field. Sure. sure. All of those things. And as it turns out, 
this has all happened within the last decade, more or less since the last time we talked. You know, I've talked about the Hefter Research Institute, which I'm affiliated with. Uh, and then there's MAPS, which is a much more larger and well-known institution. But basically, most of the scientists uh, that are working in this field today, uh, you know, are affiliated with institutions like New York University, Johns Hopkins, UCLA, you know, Harvard. So these are not podunk institutions, you know. These are some pretty pretty well-credentialed institutions. And within that framework, uh, these investigators have got uh, a number of research programs going right now, clinical trials. That's, That's the... That's the uh, holy grail, really, when it comes to clinical research with psychedelics. You have to do an FDA-approved clinical trial, and it takes uh, a lot of doing to get the permission to do that, but you you can get it. All right. I I would imagine a lot of of paperwork. All right. um, Hold hold tight, uh, Dennis. We are at a break point, so stay right where you are. Uh, This is the longer break I spoke of, so relax. We'll be back in about uh, seven minutes or so. I'm Art Bell. In that darkest time between dusk and dawn, from the high desert, it's Art Bell's Midnight in the Desert. Now, here's Art. Here I am. My guest is Dr. Dennis McKenna. And uh, we are exploring the world of psychedelic drugs. And uh, I think the first question I would like to ask is, when one does the hellish amount of paperwork, no doubt, required to get permission from the government to study these drugs, I'm certain that one has to project the possibility of positive benefit or knowledge coming out of it. And I, I, I wonder, uh, I wonder, Dennis, how you um, or, or what you put down as a possible positive benefit coming from this study. Yeah, well, there are a number of them. Uh, you're right. When you get one of these FDA approved studies going, you want to have a, you want to project a therapeutic outcome, right? Why are sure. you doing this? Yeah. And it turns out there are a number of, uh, kind of intractable conditions that the, uh, psychedelics can address that no other class of psychopharmaceuticals, psychopharmaceutical medications, can really address. They can kind of scab things over, like antidepressants, SSRIs, for example, do not really resolve the underlying causes that make people depressed, right? Right. Psychedelics can address that sort of thing. They can help people get to the root of many of their problems. And so, you know, they're useful for things like PTSD, uh, the medication uh, MDMA is showing great promise to treat PTSD, and that's kind of MAPS focus right now. They're they're trying to get this this medicine approved to treat vets, right? As you know, we have lots of vets who have problems with PTSD, and yes, there really is no adequate treatment. Uh, the Hefter Research Institute, our my group which I'd like to say it's hefter.org if you want to see what we're up to, H-E-F-F-T-E-R dot org. We've kind of staked out psilocybin as our main medicine, our main uh, drug of interest right now. Okay, doctor, I'm hearing you move around something there. I'm not sure what it is. I'm okay. probably waving my hand. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Uh, waving your hand should be fine. Speaker, Art, what can I say? Yeah, it's uh, it's this kind of connection. It's perfect audio, so we yeah. tend to hear every little thing. Yeah. Uh, sorry about that. So anyway, uh, but anyway, psilocybin, as you probably know, is the active principle of the magic mushrooms. Right. 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 The psilocybin mushrooms. 
and psilocybin turns out to be a very good psychedelic to use in a clinical setting because it's fairly short acting. It's not toxic. It can be given to people in advanced states of cancer, for example. People not in the best of health can tolerate it if that's necessary. And it reliably produces a profound psychedelic experience that is not unlike a mystical experience. In fact, it is a mystical experience. So this is one of the breakthroughs of this study of this pharmacology. Uh, you know, we've come to understand we can simulate a mystical experience, and that is very meaningful and profound for many people. So if you're in a, if you're dying, for example, if you're in a, a terminal cancer patient, you're anxious about dying, right? You're anxious about death and how do you face it and what's going to happen to your loved ones and all this. Some people are so, you know, distressed by this that uh, they really need some kind of help. And we found that psilocybin in the right circumstances can help these people with anxiety, what we're calling existential anxiety, anxiety about their their fate as dying and uh, it's been tremendously helpful for a lot of people and we have there have been numerous studies now done at Johns Hopkins and NYU if you go to the Hefter research site and click on our research you can get a summary of all these studies what's going on okay um, I mean, you so say it it, it it relieves or may relieve uh, somebody's uh, hello uh, yes. It, yes. It may relieve somebody's fear or change their fear of dying. And I wanted to ask, uh, if it's because this experience, uh, uh, doctor, I guess introduces somebody to the concept of something uh, beyond the physical and, and that is where the relief comes for them? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it introduces them to the idea that you know, not necessarily that death is not the end, but the the psychedelics sometimes resemble the near-death experience, you know, and whatever goes on in the near-death experience, whether it's a transient, you know, neurochemical event or whether it's really an entry to some other place, I don't think science can really say. But uh, the psilocybin experience when, you know, in these folks that are, they're facing death. It helps reduce their anxiety, and maybe that's because they experience a profoundly altered state. And maybe they say, "Well, hey, this isn't so bad," you know. But, okay, but could, I, could, I could, could it be? I'm sorry, doctor. Could it be that the the wire connecting to your headphones or something is moving around? It's kind of constant. Oh gosh, um, um, something is rattling around. Uh, could be the USB connection. I'm not sure. <laughs> Uh, yeah, now I'm hearing a lot of rattling. Uh, well, I'm touching the headphones now. Um, I could try a different headphone. I don't have the mic on it, but I could try that. Uh, no, that's a, probably not a good idea. Um, okay. It's something rubbing or something. I can't quite put my finger on it. I'm sorry to even be having to mention this to you, but, but it's yeah, like going on constantly. <laughs> uh, well, I'm not touching the headphones, and the USB cord port is... Pretty well seated, so I'll just sounds all right now. Okay. Um, okay. I'll try so to not move. <laughs> okay. So anyway, um, yeah. Are we talking about a near death experience or something just similar to it? Have you come that far in research to say, look, we're well, it certain depends on the drug in a certain sense. I mean, DMT, which is a close relative of psilocybin, right. but much more short acting and much much more uh, reality altering, I guess you could say. DMT at high doses does actually resemble the near death experience in remarkable ways. Uh, psilocybin doesn't get you quite that far, but it does put you into a profound state. And and the outcome that we're observing with the, with the patients, the terminal patients that take this, is not so much that they've experienced death and that they, you know, are prepared for it. It's more that it's more like a realization that they're no longer obsessed with their death. 
you know, they come away with it with the realization, well, okay, I'm alive now. I'm alive in this moment. Why not focus on that and not be preoccupied with death? And I think that's the meaningful, you know, outcome for these people. They stop worrying. They say, yeah, death is there, but I'm here now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, would so would you extend in. that? Would you extend that? To say, uh, yeah, death is there, but there may well be, or I may have had a glimpse of something beyond. Yes, exactly that too. That may be, but I'm reassured that death is there. That's not necessarily the end. You know, it's a transition, and whether that's true or not doesn't really matter. The important thing is, it's it matters to them. You know, it helps them cope with what's happening to them. Sure. But, uh, you know, uh, the, the scope of therapeutic applications for psilocybin is, is way beyond this. You know, it, it, it can be used to treat addictions. We've got protocols going for alcoholism and cocaine addiction. Uh, you know, it can be used as a, as I mentioned before, an, a tool in neuroscience if you want to understand the pro what's going on in your brain we now have very fancy toys for this neuroimaging devices like fmri and this sort of thing so you can take a person in a mystical state induced by psilocybin and put them into a fmri and see what parts of their brain are Lighting you up. know activated or suppressed or whatever and you can compare that to say a, a person who's never taken psilocybin, like a Tibetan monk or somebody who's meditated all their lives, you see remarkable similarities. Okay, if you wouldn't mind, uh, let's go back to um, the possibility of helping people who are addicted to other substances. Um, I wonder okay. in in what way you feel, in other words, is it a pharmaceutical change that occurs in their brain, or is it some revelation they have while taking the drug. In other words, how does it help? I think it's both. I don't. I don't think you can separate these things. Uh, for example, uh, with psilocybin, um, there's a young uh, investigator at Johns Hopkins who's part of the psilocybin research team, named Matt Johnson. He's been doing studies with uh, psilocybin and smoking cessation. Uh huh. And you wouldn't think that a psychedelic would assist with that, but he is uh, getting some remarkable results. He's working with people who are lifetime smokers, you know, three packs a day, serious, serious addicts who have right. not been able to give up smoking despite many attempts. He has found that with two uh, fairly high-dose psilocybin treatments and a lot of counseling, obviously, leading up to this and following on, but about 60% of his larger sample, and in some some other studies, almost 80% of the subjects were able to kick cigarettes. And basically, were six months down the road, a year down the road, they were tobacco-free. What percentage again, please? I'm sorry. 60 to 80%. My God, that's incredible. Uh, that... Oh, yeah. This totally wipes out the result of any other kind of treatment. I mean, it is completely... You know, it's remarkable. <laughs> it absolutely is remarkable. Okay, and, and again, I, I've got to ask. Um, you say it's a combination of pharmaceutical effect and counseling. Um, well, other methods use lots of counseling along with whatever pill or gum or patch or whatever it is they offer, and they don't get anywhere near those rates of... of right. Well, a lot of the counseling has to do with, uh, you know, the preparation for the experience, right? And thinking about your problem and you wish to quit smoking and when you have this experience, you're going to, you know, be in a, a state of deep introspection where you're going to have to confront this. And so a lot of it is to prepare people to, in terms of how they think of these problems. And when you, of addiction particularly and when you say well is this pharmaceutical or is this psychological it really is a combination but I think that with I think that uh, psychedelics in themselves do not cure addiction what they do is they let you step out of the box a little bit and look at your behavior and look at your 
relationship to the other drug, the one you're abusing, alcohol, heroin, whatever, uh, make you look at that relationship in a different light and essentially see it as something that, you know, that's not you, that's not part of you, and you, you actually can make a conscious decision to change your behavior you know, while you're out of the box, right? The, sure. the question becomes what happens when you, you come down and you re-enter your normal life? Yes. A lot of people can slip back into their old habits. And so it takes some planning, but the, the temporary, uh, you know, ability to step out of your own reference frame essentially for a while and look at it from that perspective, that is a tremendous opportunity. And then, you know, whatever the ultimate success depends on whatever follow up there is to that. So well, it's complicated. That, you know? that, that's true of all cessation methods for smoking, for example, but, but again, right. they don't get anywhere near a 60%. Oh my right, goodness. because they don't, uh, they don't provide, and I think this is important in psychedelic therapy of all kinds. This, this comes up particularly when we're talking about ayahuasca. I think that, uh, that catharsis, catharsis is something that psychedelics can reliably induce. You know, and catharsis is a, defined various ways, but it's a kind of, it's a spiritual, it's a crisis. It's a personal, spiritual, psychological crisis. Uh, that leads to renewal, essentially. So it's a sort of reworking of this whole thing, some of which I think does take place on the neurochemical level. Some of it just takes place on the, on the, on the attitudinal level, you know, the way you understand yes. your relationship to your drug or your medicine or, or, you know, really your whole environment. Would you go so far as to say it kind of rewires the brain? Yeah, I would, actually. I think it probably does. And, and in fact, in the case of uh, ayahuasca, you know, we have evidence for that uh, as a result of this uh this study that we did in 1993 with the, with the UDV the Brazilian church in in Brazil in uh, Manaus Brazil that that uses ayahuasca as a as a sacrament they invited us myself and a bunch of other scientists of various disciplines to mm -hmm. come in and do a biomedical study of their practices, right? Sure. And uh, they were trying to, they wanted to be sure it was safe, and they also wanted to persuade the Brazilian government that it was safe and it was okay and not a drug abuse problem and all that. So they asked us to do this investigation. One of the interesting things we found from that was that uh, in long-term users of ayahuasca, there was an elevation in the brain, a long-term elevation of a very important key uh, protein in the neurotransmitters. Um, I mentioned that psychedelics work on serotonin. Well, the another important serotonin thing is so-called the uh, serotonin transporters, those are the molecules that are the proteins that SSRIs work on, right? And they block the reuptake, the SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, right? That tells us what they do. They suck the serotonin back up. Okay, so that's getting a little technical for me. Would it's it be getting fair a little technical. Would it be Some. fair to say that it's like the train that takes the good stuff to its destination? That's a or a vacuum cleaner is a better analogy in the in the presynaptic membrane that right. sucks everything back up and reuses right. it. Right. But that's not what ayahuasca did. What we found was that the ayahuasca actually caused these these transporters to multiply to increase their density in the membrane. That's called upregulation in pharmacology, and. We didn't know what that meant when we detected this event with this effect. We thought, what does this mean? Why does it upregulate these, these transporters? Then we got looking into the literature, and it turns out there were all sorts of syndromes related to abnormal 
abnormally low levels of these transporters, abnormal deficits in the transporters were linked to things like alcoholism, uh, intractable depression, suicidal behavior, even homicidal behavior. So we thought, wow, this is really a pretty clear relationship, you know. I mean, there are all of these pathologies related to, you know, abnormal deficits in serotonin transporters, and ayahuasca reverses this. Okay, I mean, so this then, is then, then may, maybe the average person could think of it as more trains to more take trains, to right. take more trains, better, to better right. vacuum. That's cleaning. right. That's right. Exactly. That's right. To get more of the good stuff where it needs to go more frequently. Right. That's right. So, so that's evidence that uh, you know these psychedelics can, in some ways, rewire your neurochemistry. Um, you know, and MDMA is uh, another one, you know, quite, uh, you know, for a long time it was thought that MDMA was neurotoxic to serotonin receptors, uh, serotonin neurons, and it is at higher, at high doses, but they're usually quite a bit more than any, any human would take. It turns out at the lower level, they actually, they don't, they're not neurotoxic, but what they probably do is increase neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity is just the ability of the cha- of the brain to change, to adapt to new conditions. All right, I'll hold it. Used hold to be thought that neurons never changed. You All got right. a certain complement, and that was it. That, All right, that Doctor, part. hold hold it there. We've got a break, and I've got a break here, so we'll be right back. Two minutes, and we will continue with Doctor Dennis McKenna. in the desert doesn't screen calls. We trust you, but remember, the NSA, well, you know. To call the show, please dial 1-952-225-5278. That's 1-952-CALL-ART. Dr. Dennis McKenna is my guest, and we are discussing psychedelic drugs, uh, the possible benefits of them, uh, why they're being studied, and what they might help, and why. So, uh, back to it. I did get one quick, uh, computer message that I want to pass on. It's Rice from Dunsmuir who says, you know, I cannot think of a worse idea than putting somebody in an MRI machine while they're tripping. <laughs> Got a point. Well, these are, uh, these are intrepid pioneers of science. <laughs> that they are, but I mean, clunk, clunk, clunk. <laughs> right, well. Anything for science, right? Yes. I mean, uh-huh. Most of these people, yeah, I mean, I agree. That wouldn't be the optimal uh, setting, but what are you going to do? Yeah, what are you going to do? <laughs> um, well, what do they see? I mean, what lights up in the brain? Well, uh, there's interesting, uh, you know, again, I, I don't want to get too technical, but there's some interesting findings in some places, some parts of the brain, we find that psilocybin really activates neural networks, activates interconnectivity. So that's basically cross-talk, <laughs> right? Huh, yes. Other other groups have found that some parts of the brain that it actually suppresses, believe it or not, communication between certain parts of the brain that normally are in tight communication. Hmm. So these are two different findings that are kind of puzzling. A lot of it has to do with dose and, you know, circumstances, but in both cases you can, you know, at certain doses psilocybin will activate these networks, but not necessarily across the whole brain, maybe only in certain regions. At the same time, these regions, like the cortex, the limbic system, mostly the amygdala, these areas are involved, uh, you know, are, are the communication between them is suppressed. And so the thinking is that maybe these feedback loops that always exist between these different groups, they sometimes have a, they put the brakes on, mm-hmm. right? They help maintain homeostasis, so they have a, a, an inhibitory uh, function, and if you break those connections temporarily, then each part is just free to, you know, f- free associate, if it will, just go off on its own and without any 
without any inhibitions. Have the experiments that you all have been doing uh, yet led to any FDA-approved use of them? Well, no, we're uh, we're not at that stage yet. I mean, the the clinical trials are FDA approved, right? To, to do the trials, it's right, a long right, right. way to from doing a trial to getting a drug into the clinic, right? That's sure. that's the long road that we have to travel is from phase one to phase two to phase three. Uh, clinical trials, each one involving more people and each one involving a lot more money. I mean, almost exponentially more money as you go up. Phase three trial might be hundreds of people at three or four different universities. So that's millions. And once a drug crosses that threshold and, you know, we're a long way from that, then it will be, can be approved for, for clinical use. Mm-hmm. And there are people that are, that are working on that, that are ready to do that. Um, I want to mention something that might be of interest to your listeners. Um, There's a wonderful website called clinicaltrials.gov, and you pay your tax dollars pay for this, and it is a a place you can go and find out any FDA-approved clinical study that's that's gone on that's recently over or in progress or about to start for really anything i mean if you want to research cancer treatments that's a good place to look but if you search on things like psilocybin or mdma or even lsd you know you the studies that have been done will come up so you can get a pretty good look at what's been done and what's in progress and what's planned. That's just a great resource. Money well spent by your government, which rarely spends money well. So uh, take a look. All right. Um, When you look at the current state of affairs with the war on drugs in America, actually in the world, but certainly in America anyway, um, what are your comments? Well, I think the... uh, you know, the last, I mean, the war on drugs was really initiated at the end of the 60s. So we're coming on, what, uh, you know, uh, 45 years. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a it's a miserable and total failure. Mm. Um, you know, I mean, a, over a trillion dollars has been spent on it. And there are more drugs than ever. Um, there are more people in jail for drugs than ever, especially in this country. And it's just not the solution. You know, it's not working, uh, prohibiting people from altering their consciousness, uh, is not the right approach because it's, it's a fundamental, uh, instinct of behavior and this is just something that we do. You know, so the right approach, in my opinion, is you have to educate people about how to use drugs. <laughs> That's the bottom line. You have to educate people how to avoid the really harmful ones and use the ones that aren't so harmful in a way that's intelligent and, you know, maximizes their bad side effects and, and or minimizes their bad side effects, maximizes their benefits. Okay, well, you mentioned that so, there are a lot of people in jail, and there are, um, yeah. gee, millions. And so what would you do? Would you legalize drugs, and, and which ones would you consider legalizing, or would you do it across the board and then just do education. Well, it's a tough call, yes. you know, yes, but I would pretty much legalize them across the board, but I would regulate the I would regulate them. So, you know, if you're addicted to say meth or something, one of the really destructive drugs, I wouldn't just dispense that out of vending machines, right? I would say, okay, you're a meth addict, so you like meth, so here's a prescription. Go to the drugstore and get your meth. But every time you go to get your prescription, you basically have a teachable moment. You have a chance for a drug counselor, the pharmacist, doctor, whoever, to hey, say, hey, you know, do you really want to take meth? You know, is this is not good for you? Have you thought about other choices? Have you thought about, you know, and just basically encourage people to, you know, uh, to intelligent behavior. It's all about education. Besides that, doctor, uh, trying to imagine this, uh, people will kick a Coke machine because they don't get their Coke. Imagine the meth guy who puts 20 bucks in, doesn't get his meth. He's going to turn that thing into twisted metal. 
Right. Well, that's why you get it from a pharmacist, right? Because we, <laughs> we can't. Yeah. But, you know, but ideally that's the thing. You cannot, uh, you know, you can't prevent people from altering their consciousness. It's built into human behavior. What you can do is encourage them to, if they're going to do that with artificial chemistry or plant chemistry or whatever, then teach them how to make good choices, uh, you know, or teach them ways to get there without drugs. There are plenty of those ways, too. So sure. meditation, all this stuff should be encouraged. But people are going to take drugs. This is a fact of life. Part, partly it's because people are made of drugs. This is what I have started saying in my lectures. People take drugs because they're made of drugs. The reason drugs work is because we are essentially bags of neurotransmitters and hormones and all these biochemical processes drugs. on some levels mm. that drugs work on. So, uh, you know, it's it's just a fact of life. We have to acknowledge that we're... It is a fact of life. In fact, a lot of people uh, have to take drugs because their bodies don't make enough of that drug, right? Uh, well, in some cases, yeah. Yes. Yeah, I mean, not not as a rule but a lot of cases like thyroxin for example the the you know the thyroid hormone uh -huh. people have hot thyroid surgery they have to take artificial thyroid ho hormone forever and that's just a replacement of what their body doesn't make or you Insulin. know parkinson we don't make enough dopamine so you get parkinson's disease take precursors to parkinson's yeah so sometimes that's that's what drugs do Okay, or or the other way around. I mean, as you point out, we are made up of drugs and a body that creates drugs for its own safety. Right. And essentially our brain chemistry is a soup of drugs. You know, that that's what neurotransmitters are essentially. They they're drugs. They just happen to be drugs that our bodies make and, you know, which are essential for the functioning of our brain and then, you know, drugs that we might introduce into that system from outside, plant chemicals or whatever, they usually work on neurotransmitters in some way. You know, that's kind of where the rubber meets the road when it comes to psychoactive drugs. They work on different neurotransmitters. There are many neurotransmitters, about 50 different types in the body, uh, you know, and each has their own population of receptors that they work on and many, many subtypes of these receptors. So, you know, it's a complex story, but it's basically about neurons talking to each other, you know, largely via uh, neurotransmitters. So, I mean, there are other kinds of communication, like voltage-gated neurotransmission and that sort of thing. But basically, it's chemical neurotransmitters that, you know, that run consciousness, mm -hmm. if you want to put that consciousness runs on, and largely the serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine are the, are the three biggies, glutamate, all these things. You can't, it's a complex picture, right, which we mm -hmm. probably don't have time to get into. Okay. Um would you say, um, I don't know who puts these questions together, whether these came from you or from my producer, but one of them is, are our souls somehow naturally entangled with DMT? Is that you? That was probably one of the questions that your creative producer came up with. I see. Um, okay. Great, great producer, by the way. She, oh, she's, she's something else. She's great. She's, yes, Heather. Very smart young young woman. She is. Um, she gave me a list of questions. I added a two. I added two. Um, the question: If DMT is tangled up with the soul, um, well, it certainly occurs naturally in the human body, right? So it is a <laughs> naturally occurring psychedelic. Yes. That's found in the body. Yes. And, uh, we're not sure what it's doing there. And it's kind of controversial because we don't really understand. A lot of people say it has to do with pineal function and the whole third eye thing. And we know that, uh, that DMT occurs in the pineal, uh, at least sometimes. And all the precursors for it are there and all the enzymes needed to make it are there. So it's probably, pretty sure that it occurs there whether it does anything whether it actually has a psychedelic effect when that happens mm -hmm. is a matter of 
controversy, you know. And uh, I mean, I my dear friend Dave Nichols, who's the president of the Hefter Research Institute, you know, and if there's no better pharmacologist when it comes to psychedelics, he's the world's expert, and he says DMT probably never reaches levels in the tissues or at the neurons where it can actually act as an as a psychedelic. All right, let me back but up just, just, just a little bit and ask ask this question. Um, yeah. Most doctors, and I interview many doctors, many scientists, I would say by far would say they don't believe in God. Typical of what a doctor would say, that they don't believe in, in God. I, I think in medical school beginning or perhaps even before that, they're sort of trained out of that. Mm-hmm. And... Um, you know, when you begin talking about souls, then inevitably you're talking about, well, are we more than our material and mental selves, um, right. whether there is something else? And I, where where do you come down in this range? Well, again, you know, this is a complex question. You right? bet it is. Yes, um, it is. Yeah, most scientists in their scientific training and physicians and so on, they are trained into reductionism. Yes. You know, reductionism being the idea that it's all matter, there really is no spirit in life, there yes. really is no no supernatural. This is all just atoms, you know, yes. ultimately crashing about and exactly. and doing things in random ways. Um but then you have this naughty problem of subjective experience, right? We all have subjective experience. Sure. And although Scientists might be atheists. They might deny the existence of God. It's very hard for them to deny the existence of mind, of their own mind, of their own consciousness. And that's a reality. You know, Mm. thoughts are real. Consciousness is real. Yes, it is. So what is it? (laughs) Right? Well, uh, okay, let let, let us try this. Uh, Let me pin you down in a different way. This is what neuroscience can't quite explain yet. All right. When when uh, the brain waves go flat and there's no heartbeat and there's no respiration mm-hmm. and the body grows cold, is there, uh, in your estimation, uh, the possibility of anything uh, continuing in terms of what we would think of as consciousness? You know, uh, honestly, I can't answer that question, and I, I don't think any honest uh, anybody who assesses it honestly can say. You know, I mean, you're talking about, you know, consciousness in some form is yes. an energy state, yes. right? It's a stable energy state. It's associated with the brain. It's associated with neuroactivity. It's it's. Uh, you know, and you would think that it's dependent on that physical substrate to keep going, right? But just maybe there's a way that it doesn't depend on those things. This is what we, this is what we don't know, you know, because nobody, we've had people who have had near death experiences and they've come back and reported on what happened. That's right. We don't have anybody who's actually died and come back and reported what happens and, and I think that uh, you know, I think that I think that we have to keep an open mind because I think that we don't know a lot. And I think I think this is something that that science uh, you know is quick to be dismissive. And I, I think that uh, you know, I think that science needs to remind itself every day, every moment that what we don't know is much greater than what we do know, <laughs> you know, what science thinks it knows. So sure. there is no place in this equation for arrogance, right? I mean, science can be proud of what it knows, but it should always remind itself most of the universe we don't yet understand. And that's great. I don't find that depressing. I found that challenging and kind of joyful because it means there's a whole lot left to be learned. The important thing is we have to keep an open mind. You know, we cannot abandon our our analytical capabilities, but we, you know, when science says a case is open and shut, we thoroughly understand this phenomenon. We can put that on the shelf and forget about it. This is a settled matter. You know, the history of science has shown again and again that about the time science reaches that point, 
the whole thing blows up, and it turns out, you know, new information comes in, and it's not at all the way they thought. Oh, you are so so correct. Examples would be uh, recent news from science on the benefits of coffee. Uh, and e- even more controversial, yeah. recent news from science on the benefits of fatty foods. Yep. Yep. <laughs> exactly. Um, that one really cracked me up. I, I just don't know... How they can What's keep accepted us... as as established dogma? Yeah, turns out a few years later, no, the we opposite. were completely wrong That's about right. all that. That's right. <laughs> right. That's right. You'd think they, you'd think that they would get it, and that this would be a cause for humility and a cause for you know keeping keeping our minds open. This is the thing. Just keep your mind open. You can accept what's known, but you have to remember it may all be turned over next week, you know, or overturned. It, this is the way this is the way discovery works ideally. Uh you know, I mean our picture of cosmology due to you know relativity and quantum mechanics is Quite a bit different than somebody a thousand years ago, you know, <laughs> or even two hundred years. Quite ago. a bit different. <laughs> yeah, quite different. So science is powerful, but it is—it's uh, also limited, and science scientists should keep that in mind. Well, okay. Uh, with How's that for dodging a question? <laughs> well, not bad at all, actually. Um, so, DMT. There are people who are claiming that uh, a DMT experience is the same as an NDE. Um, I, I guess you've looked into DMT, and you've looked perhaps into NDEs, have you, by the way? Yeah, yeah yes? I have. And also uh, abduction experiences. People claim right. that uh, high doses of DMT are not unlike abduction experiences. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm not That's know. true. You know, I haven't had that kind of experience on DMT, although I will say, you know, the ones I've had are often quite, uh, uh, you know, science fiction-ish in a way. I mean, you see machines, you see entities that appear to be aliens or uh-huh. not human. You often encounter these these entities, is I guess the way, the term. <coughs> you, so you, you have encountered these entities, Oh yeah, I have. I I uh I think anyone who takes a high dose of DMT is probably going to going to run into these critters, you know. I mean, they're out there. What are they? That's what's harder to say. Are they So how do you subjectively um I don't know, describe uh what you have encountered? Well, everybody has a different kind of encounter with them, although there are similarities. Uh you know, Terence used to talk about the elf machines, you know, the self-transforming elf machines or the, uh, you know, the hyperdimensional uh, uh, Fabergé eggs or yes. you know, these things, which do often appear to be, you know, machine-like and sometimes intelligent, sometimes intelligent machine. It's very hard to say because we only have our categories to you know describe things and and in DMT it goes way beyond category so essentially the experience is really hard to stuff into a a box of description a linguistic box even though you know it's a natural impulse to start to do that even before it's over you're trying you know you're babbling you're trying to explain what <laughs> what what was that yes. you know it's what we try to do is make sense out of things it doesn't necessarily make sense but it's overwhelming and it's and it's quite alien it's very hard to relate to anything else uh and is it real <laughs> well you know well uh doctor when when you right have what do we mean by yes, real when right? you have come back yeah and you have experienced these entities is it for at least a short time until your doctor's rational mind begins to crank away again um, and you're away from the drug, uh, is it for a short time unquestion, unquestionably legal, uh, legal, uh, real? 
Yeah, well, it certainly isn't legal. <laughs> You're not in that context. But no, not legal, but, but it's real. It's the interesting question of, you know, what is all this drug prohibition? Yes, yes, yes. Not prohibition yes. of consciousness. But right. we won't go right there there right now. But but is it unquestionably be real? real? Well, yes. here's the thing. I experience it as real, you know, so it's real in that sense. And if you think about it... Hmm. Everything that we experience is, uh, you know, a hallucination in a certain way. Everything that we experience, you know, this is what our brains do. They construct a model of reality, and that's the reality that we live in. You know, we're in the hallucination. We're part of the movie that our brains are creating. So that's our reality. Is it real? Well, we experience it as real. Is it? Does it map onto, you know, the the real world, the world that physics and everything else tells us is out there, which I call the unknowable real world, you know, and, and the physicists tell it that the real world, as our instruments measure it, doesn't look anything like your subjective experience. But everybody is walking around with a subjective experience. That's a model that they're living in. That's a hallucination. And then when you bring drugs into the uh, the picture, I mean, basically what you're doing is changing the frequency a little bit. You're mm-hmm. tweaking the neurochemistry just enough that you're getting different, you know, a, a different, you're looking at it through a different lens. Well, okay, let, let, yeah. let's approach it from this direction. If uh, a researcher like yourself came back from a trip and wrote, in some peer-reviewed journal that he met aliens, they definitely were aliens, <laughs> or entities, he'd probably not be a prudential researcher very much longer unless he had really good tenure. <laughs> uh, this is true. Yes, this would not be a welcome message in, in peer-reviewed journals, you know, but you have to be honest about what you experience. I mean, you know, my, my friend and, and a, a person known to many people in the psychedelic community, uh, you know, Dr. Rick Strassman, who was really a pioneer in DMT research. I mean, in the early 90s, he was the first uh, physician, psychiatrist in, in 20 years to actually get an FDA-approved protocol to study a psychedelic drug. Mm -hmm. And the drug he chose was DMT. And he gave DMT by injection over a range of doses to uh, more than 60 people over a period of time. And many of those people reported these near-death experiences, alien abduction experiences, all this crazy stuff, right? So poor Rick. Well, I'm, you know, I'm saying maybe crazy. Well, maybe crazy. This is what they were reporting. They to the, to them this was real. But poor Rick, he's got to write a report to NIH. He's got to write. That's right. You know his grant, and, That's right. and finally he just being an honest scientist. You know, finally he threw up his hands and he said, "I can't make sense of this. I cannot discount it." But how do I report this to, you know, mm. to a peer reviewed journal? I mean, he did report it, but always with the caveat that, that this is what people were reporting. He doesn't say it's real or not. He just says this is, uh, this is the observation. So that's, that's honest science, I think. Yes, doesn't this in a way describe some difference between Terence and yourself, uh, in that you are reporting things as a scientist? Terence came back and said, man, here's what happens. And here's who you meet, and here's yep. what you're going to see. Well, yeah, he was a he was a narrator of his experiences there, so he was reporting phenomenologically what he saw, and right. that's perfectly legitimate. Those experiences were real, as far as he was concerned, and I experience them too, and they're real when I'm having them. I just look at. I just wonder, like a lot of people, what is the, you know, what is the machinery, the neurochemistry, the, the whatever it is that gives <laughs> rise to these experiences? Or is there really another dimension somewhere out there in hyperspace, whatever, that, that these, these materials give you access to? Well, that's what, that's really, that's I, really, doctor, what I want to know. Yeah, well. 
take a number. <laughs> <laughs> We'd all like to know. Yes, and, well. And the question is, how do you answer that question? You know, it's very, very difficult. I mean, Terrence was always trying to get the entities and whoever, this, this logos that he could reliably contact on mushrooms to tell him something that he couldn't know, that he couldn't possibly know any other way. And he would take that as proof of some kind that at least they're real. You know, this information is not coming from within him. Mm-hmm. Very hard. They're very tricky, these entities. You know, they, they don't <laughs> cough this up very easily. And I don't think he ever succeeded. You know, so it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's complex. But, but, you know, eh, so it's sort of, that's the thing. It's sort of, we fabricate our own reality. We fabricate our own hallucination and we proceed to live there. Yes, sir. Hold, hold tight. We're at a break. And yeah. uh, I, so I have to break. It's a good long one. We'll be right back with Dr. Uh, Dennis McKenna. I'm Art Bell. Her hair is hollow gold. Her lips sweet surprise. Her hands are never cold. She's got that. Remember, when calling Midnight in the Desert, let the phone ring until answered. These calls are unscreened for your listening pleasure. Call 1-952-CALL-ART. That's 1-952-225-5278. All right. What we're going to do is open up the lines. Let me give you the uh, little lecture that I give. Dr. Dennis McKenna is my guest, and he is involved in testing uh, some pretty serious drugs, actually, ayahuasca and much more. Uh, DMT, uh, just the wildest drugs you can imagine. He is doing legitimate tests on these drugs, what they do, what they mean, whether what they mean is real or... I guess it is. You know, to most of the people that have taken them, they describe it as absolutely real as his brother did. Anyway, I'm, I want to open the line. So if you want to get in on the discussion and have a question or what have you, our public number is uh, 1 and then area code 952-225-5278. Once again, one 952 Now, if you have a device. <laughs> oh, there was something else. There's something else I've got to tell you guys about. Um, AT&T has begun something called uh, a Wi-Fi calling. And um, if you're in an area that has a lousy cell signal, let me tell you how you can improve. And I don't mean just by a little bit the quality of your audio. If you go to their Wi-Fi calling, and I'll, I'll sort of have a clinic some night uh, about how you do it, Boy, oh boy, can you sound good, and if you're in a bad cell area, it will be, it could be your savior, believe me. Uh, Other companies are doing it, but AT&T just let loose of uh, a Wi-Fi calling, and boy, does it sound good. Boy, does it sound good. Anyway, where was I? Yes, um, Skype. You can put Skype on your device, your iPhone, or your uh, uh, whatever your device is. (laughs) There's so many of them out there now, it's hardly... Worth mentioning, all of them virtually. Uh, put Skype on, and then once you get Skype on, uh, simply put us in there. Uh, add us on Skype. You got a little plus sign there on Skype, and uh, that's like adding somebody. So add us. We are in North America, American Canada, MITD51, uh, as in Midnight in the Desert, MITD51. If you're outside of the country, we are MITD. Five five, it is that simple. And um, rarely do you get the opinion. You know, opinions vary so much. Uh, for example, I'm looking now at uh, what we call the wormhole messages that come to me while I'm doing the show. This will give you an idea of the range of the way things like this are received. Wade, uh, don't know where he is, um, says boring, boring, putting me to sleep. Not one of your better shows. Joy in Santa Cruz says. This is within four 
uh, sentences of each other. Joy says, now, now this is the good stuff, Art. Absolutely the reason why I'm a time traveler. Thank you so much for interviewing him, meaning Dennis, Dr. Dennis McKenna. This is absolutely fascinating. So, you know, not, not one thing, uh, hits people the same way. It's, uh, well, frankly, quite subjective. Um, uh, doctor, welcome back. Thank you. Sure. Uh, it's great to have you. And um, you are giving out extremely important information, whether uh, in, in some cases, obviously, it puts people to sleep. In other cases, uh, it rivets them uh, to the radio or the device of their choice, whatever. Um, I personally think that it is one of the most important shows we've done. Um, it is yet one other avenue to that which I explore here constantly, and, and really, I do believe this, Doctor, that it is one, what's the right word, one legitimate possible avenue to answering the questions that we explore on this program, the, the really big ones in life. Well, yes, I agree. I mean, you can't please everyone. Right. No, oh no, I'm so well aware of that. If you find it boring, don't listen. <laughs> yeah, that's, no, that's, that's, that's right. That's right. Um, well, okay. Uh, let us, uh, if you don't mind, uh, allow some of the people in the audience to ask questions. Would that be okay? Sure. All right. Let's go to uh, Hawaii. Uh, I think uh, Hilo, Hawaii. Hello. 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 You're squeaking and squealing and making all kinds of noise there. Hey, that's the cookies in the background. The what in the background? The cookie frogs. Oh, the frogs. The cookie frogs. Yeah. Really? Are they that loud? <laughs> yeah, well, I'm on the big island. Um, right. I actually went to Terrence's uh, property in South Kona back in... I don't know, it must have been around 92, 93. Right. Can you possibly walk into another room which is frog protected a little bit? No, I'm out here in the jungle. I, I'm in a one room, uh, place. And, <laughs> right. uh, you know, this is it. it All right. Well, if you have a question, cool. yeah, if you have a question, go ahead. Well, no, I, I don't have a question as much as, uh, you know, if this is putting somebody to sleep, they never did DMT. Oh, <laughs> uh, well, that may be true. Yeah, that, and it would be a yeah. high percentage of the audience. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I mean, I um, I lived in the Bay Area in the early seventies, and um, you know, I loved doing uh, psilocybin and LSD and that kind of thing. But uh, DMT is just a whole different. Um, Experience. Degree of intensity. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, it's like uh, uh, you don't do it for fun. <laughs> you know, it's, no. you're an explorer if you do it. You may you may do it for fun the first time, but if that's the situation, you don't ever do it again. All right, I understand. If you do it around those frogs, I bet you don't ever do it again either. I mean, DMT is very interesting for a number of reasons. You know, like the gentleman says, it's a whole other level of intensity. And then there's the fact that, you know, it's part of our neurochemistry, right? None of these other things are, as far as we know. So it's really built into, you know, the chemistry of our brain. And not only that, it's very, very widespread in, in the plant kingdom. It's a very simple molecule. It's only two steps from tryptophan. And tryptophan is an amino acid that's found in all living things because it's part of the 30 the amino acids, or what is it, 20, I guess, that go into proteins. Tryptophan is one of those. And tryptophan can be converted to DMT mm-hmm. in two steps. So there are many, many plants that contain it. Uh, you know, we know of about a hundred or two hundred, but those, but that's only because people have looked. It's very likely that hundreds of thousands, if not tens of thousands of plants contain DMT. 
not always in levels that would be right. high or usable, but but it's a very common compound. It's not an exaggeration to see that nature, you know, is drenched in DMT. I sometimes say this: nature's drenched mm-hmm. in DMT. Mm-hmm. So why is this psychedelic so pervasive in the ecosphere, in the biosphere? What what is going on with that, Doctor? And, uh, can you can you explain in uh for example, time. How long is a DMT trip? It's quite short, is it not? <clears throat> well, there are two ways to approach a DMT trip. DMT by itself is not orally active, right, because it's chopped up in the gut by these enzymes called monoamine oxidase, uh, monoamine oxidases. So if you eat DMT or eat a plant that contains DMT, nothing is going to happen, right? You have to take DMT Parenterally is the term, other than by mouth. You can snort it, you know, and there's a whole ethnopharmacology of snuffs in South America, DMT containing snuffs, or you can take it in combination with another plant that contains a monoamine oxidase inhibitor, another set of compounds that will knock out those gut enzymes. Then it becomes orally active. Hmm. And that's the secret of ayahuasca. Ayahuasca is a combination of two plants, one of which contains DMT, and the other contains another group of alkaloids called beta-carbolates that knock out MAO in the gut. So they protect the DMT. It's absorbed unchanged. It makes it to the brain unchanged. And then it's, instead of 15 minutes or or so, when you take it parentally, when you snort it or inject it, it's very, very short. But instead of that, it's four to six or seven hours. Wow. So it's stretched out. It's not as intense as when you take DMT, you know, uh, parentally, say, but it, you, you get more out of it. It's more relatable because you spend more time there. And you can you can learn more about what what this state, this dimension, or whatever what, what it's all about. Do you really feel that that it is possibly another dimension? Well, like I say, I don't think we can dismiss it. You know, mm-hmm. I don't think we can dismiss that possibility that somehow. You know, because we don't really understand what the mind is, right? We know that the mind has physical roots in the brain. It has a connection to physical substrates. But then it also seems to have elements that are not physical, maybe extra-dimensional, hyper-dimensional, or so on. Yes, sir. And maybe they do tap into some extra-dimensional realm. I mean, this is where, you know, to approach these questions scientifically is difficult. I don't think science can really say at this point one way or the other, but I think it's possible, you know. Um, I was, yeah, so it's it's possible. Okay. And certainly subjectively it seems so. And if you talk to indigenous people, you know, people who use ayahuasca as part of their ethnomedicine, right. <clears throat> you know, for them this reality is just it's just accepted unless it will, you know, of course, this is the way it is. You see how it is. This is how we experience it. They don't really get into these, uh, uh, you know, debates about whether it's real or whether it's not. These are, you know, the, in some ways, these, these notions are, are the, the product of Cartesian dualism and the whole, you know, scientific philosophical tradition of the Western mind to, Indigenous people, these things are not separate. There really is no in or out. You know, the self is not separate from the nature that they're surrounded in. They experience the world quite differently, I think, than we do. I mean, for one thing, they don't have a point of view, you know, and, a, and in indigenous cultures. And the point of view is what, sep- is, you know, what separates us from nature. Uh, and and this is this is a problem. I think that I think that uh, you know one thing the psychedelics are doing as as we see things like ayahuasca suddenly go global in a sense. There, you know, everybody's excited about ayahuasca. It's all over the world. People oh, yeah. are using it. You know, I think it's trying to reconnect us with nature. Um, if you could, you know. No, you, say can put that. It, you can say that. You can put it that way. Let, let, let's yeah. go to Skype. Uh, Michelle, you're on the air. 
Oh, hi, Art. Hi. Um, I don't have a microphone, so I hope I'm close enough. Can you hear me? Yes. The key is find the little round hole in your uh, laptop, if that's what it is, yeah. and get real close. Okay, it's an iMac. Can you hear me now? Uh, yes. Yeah. Oh, I hear you. Go ahead. Okay. Clear. Okay, Claire. Okay, um, I was in Peru, and I did an ayahuasca retreat, and um, I actually I ran into Peter Gorm on the boardwalk down there in Iquitos in Peru, and uh, I think Art knows Peter Gorm. He's had him on his show. Mm-hmm. Peter uh, Gorman. Yeah, Gorman. Yeah. Yeah, anyways, he told me that uh, before tourists started arriving in Peru, uh, ayahuasca's main use with the uh, the natives down there was uh, it was to get rid of and eliminate bacteria and worms that they that they would have in their systems from living in the jungle, and that the hallucinations were actually a side effect. It actually didn't have a spiritual. They didn't have a spiritual purpose for it. This didn't start to happen until tourists started to come and they started to make money down yeah. there. And then the money is what sort of transformed the whole use of ayahuasca into this, you know, psychedelic sort of a spiritual mind trip because this is what Westerners were into and this is how, you know, they could make money for themselves. Mm-hmm. So now in the present, presently in, in Peru, there's all kinds of so-called I don't, what do they call themselves? Maestros? Maestros, ayahuasqueros, curanderos, Yeah, shamans, and, and a lot whatever. of them are self-made, uh, understandably, because they can make a, an easy dollar, and, and there's big money in it, and they need money down there, eh? Mm-hmm. So anyways, I, I, took, I was pretty modest about it, because, you know, I have enough of my own uh, hallucinations, you could say, on, on, on Earth to deal with it, and I, I didn't need to get all screwed up with <coughs> A whole bunch of ayahuasca. But anyways, I found it um, very enlightening, and, and, and it creates sort of an energetic feeling in you that you could get, say, uh, in a 10-day Vipassana sit, okay, something you actually have to work hard for uh, to bring yourself into the same sort of uh, sensitive mind space that ayahuasca takes you to, mm-hmm. say. Yeah. But the effects were very uh, short-lived. You know, it might last, you get the insights for two or three weeks, but you don't really get that deep, profound, uh, physiological sort of transformation you get with long-term uh, meditation sitting. Okay. That's, All right. that's well, that's, what, that, 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 that's a fair comment, uh, or a question, actually. And um, what do you think, Doctor? <clears throat> well, I think she's, I think she's touched on a number of interesting points. Um it's it's true that with the the ayahuasca tourism situation down in Iquitos and other places, they're clearly transforming the tradition. You know, the tradition was very different before the tourism started. Mm-hmm. It was not simply used to treat parasites. That was a use of of these plants for a long time. But if you look at indigenous groups that use ayahuasca they do in fact have spiritual traditions around this uh you know it's part of their cosmology it's part of their belief system i'm surprised that peter would say that you know that he would dismiss all that because i know peter quite well and he knows better he knows that there are spiritual traditions indigenous traditions that use ayahuasca now you know, they don't necessarily work for Westerners, right? Westerners are looking for something else. And, and ayahuasca, you know, as it's used in the tourism circuit, is has evolved into this kind of New Age-ish, you know, thing that emphasizes spirituality and self-discovery and all that a little bit more than it does in the indigenous traditions. Basically, I don't have a problem with that. I think that that's fine. What's wrong with self-discovery and, and you know, that sort of thing? I don't see anything wrong with it. The fact is that the human human's relationship with ayahuasca is a co-evolutionary process. We've been in relationship with it for probably thousands of years. This continues, and it's going to change. And as it goes global and as these indigenous cultures encounter other global cultures, it's going to be transformed. 
I don't necessarily feel that this is a bad thing. I think it's inevitable, for one thing. And I think that ayahuasca is bringing insights and healing to a lot of people uh, on a global scale. And I think that, you know, as a people and as a culture, uh, we need... Uh, Healing. We are a deeply wounded culture. We're a deeply conflicted culture. Mm -hmm. Much of that has to do with our alienation from nature. I think that one of the things ayahuasca is, one of its strongest messages that many people get is we have to rethink this understanding. We have to realize we're not separate from nature. We're part of it. Until we get that global shift uh, in consciousness, which ayahuasca is trying to catalyze, I think that we're we're not going to be able to deal with the the problems that we face and as we just we have to read the news to realize how quickly this global environmental crisis is accelerating so we're in a heap of uh trouble trouble <laughs> right uh whatever <laughs> deep do do and we yeah. have to change consciousness globally and i think that this is partly what ayahuasca is trying to catalyze now i think that somebody who goes to peru uh, probably without studying very much about what ayahuasca is about, and that's what I infer from this young woman, that she didn't really do much homework. She just kind of went down there. Doctor, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, I've got a break here. We're, okay. Uh, we've got about uh, two minutes, and we'll be right back. Yeah. Ooh, that's why I'm here. Midnight in the Desert spans the world. To call us from outside the U.S. and Canada only, use Skype with a headset mic if on a computer and call MITD55. That's MITD55. Actually, a very rare opportunity to speak with uh, Dennis McKenna, Dr. Dennis McKenna. We're talking about psychedelic drugs, EMT, ayahuasca, and more. So if you have questions, comments, um, they are welcome. I've got a question from uh, Zach Art. Is the first time caller line good every night or just occasionally? Thanks. Enjoying the show. Actually, every night, anytime you're a first time caller, let me give you the number. All right? I know it's hard to get through. So, area code 775 285 5800. If you're a first time caller only, area code 775 285 5,800, and uh, we'd be uh, more than happy to accommodate you. Once again, uh, uh, Doctor, welcome back. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, could I just kind of say something about what we were just talking about from the previous uh, questioner, caller? Yes. Uh, I, I just want to complete the thought. I think that people who think ayahuasca and these sorts of psychedelics, but maybe particularly ayahuasca, people who think that it's a shortcut don't quite understand the way it's used, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it is a difficult medicine to learn to use pro properly. There's a, a lot of training that goes into it. If, if you want to become an ayahuasca, or you have to diet with other plants. You have to go through a whole process. So it's not without discipline. And, uh, you know, it's not like uh, it's a replacement for, or it's an easier path than these other paths, like meditation and so on. It is its own path and should be respected and, and treated that way. It's not you know, it's, it's not a substitute for other paths. It is its own path, and it requires quite a lot of dedication and uh, and discipline to, to learn to use it. I mean, the indigenous people have the idea, this is their model, that these things are plant teachers. They call them teachers, plantus caensanian, plants that teach. And uh, I think this is more or less correct. You know, when you work with some of these medicines, you're basically forming a relationship with it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it may present itself as an intelligent entity that is not you, that's fine, or it might, but you're choosing to enter into a dialogue with, with something that is 
you know, that is a teacher in some sense. One way know? to put it. I mean, I've been taking it for 40 years, and I'm still learning from it. So it's, it has a lot to teach. Okay. Uh, with that in mind, uh, Resta, I believe it is, or Rita, um, is that correct? Yes, it's Rita. Okay, Rita. Oh, okay. I, I, it's not about the drug, but it's one of the things that uh, we are um, hoping to discover uh, through the drug or in various other ways, um, whether in fact we exist or our entity or soul exists mm -hmm. on the death of the body. And so I thought you might be interested in um, what happened with my children um, because of that. Um, they absolutely adored my father. And when he died, they were just inconsolable. Mm -hmm. um, my daughter particularly was um, suffering terribly. And she was losing a lot of weight. I was terribly concerned about her. And then one day, um, this would be about two months after my father died, I had handed her her laundry to put away, and she went into her bedroom, and as she walked through the bedroom, as she walked through the bedroom door, I heard her say, Mom! She didn't sound frightened, just stunned. So my husband and I raced to her bedroom. She didn't have to say a word. Her room was flooded with this French aftershave that he had always used, and I never have known anyone else to use okay, it. Okay, I, I understand. So in other words, proof of um, the other side. I, I totally get it. Uh, and and so, Doctor, um, that's right. Whether the relief comes from French aftershave that you recognize and therefore your mind puts together the fact that that's granddad and I am so comforted, I feel so much better whether it comes from something like that or one of these drugs that would suggest to somebody there there is something else, either way, the, the, the resulting answer is about the same, right? Right, right. I mean, I mean, this is a phenomenon. This is something that she experienced, you know. So I don't discount that, and I don't. I don't say it proves that your grandfather was hanging around, or I, I say that it was a phenomenon. You know, the, you probably have heard of the UFO researcher, uh, J. Allen Hynek, yes, right? Of course. I guess he's gone, but he was very famous in his day. But he said something very, you know, he was very well known for his UFO investigations, and he said something one day that really struck me. He said, I don't know if UFOs are real. But what I do know is the UFO experience is real. Mm -hmm. And that's a key difference. And so the things that we experience, like on psychedelics, like these paranormal phenomena, these anomalous phenomena, people experience them. Whether the mind makes them up or not is is open to question. It may I be even they, they, immaterial. They, it may be immaterial. In other words, yeah, if it, if it results that, in the you, comfort that uh, she described... Right. Okay. This this is part of the reality that we inhabit, you know, and we have to remember a good deal of the reality that we inhabit is our brains synthesizing this hallucination that we're living in, you know, this movie that we're inhabiting. And that's not to say that's not to dismiss it. That's just to say this is our our existential situation. Uh, you know, uh, Okay, um, let's go to uh, Stockton, California on the phone and uh, say you're on the air with the, um, the doctor. Hi. Hey, this is Benny from Stockton, California. How's it going, guys? It's going well, Good. thank you. Good. Can you hear me well? I hear you fine. Go ahead. All right. Uh, first of all, I want to say it's an honor talking to you, Dennis. Uh, I am 24, but luckily I 
came across your brother's, you know, studies uh, when I was 19 and been intrigued ever since. And uh, I would just, I'm just a little confused still on one thing. Uh, the singularity, I know it's kind of really, I mean, it's probably the most complex thing he actually did, but, or I, I mean, looked into, I should say. But um, you've been knocking these, these questions out in a nutshell remarkably. So if you can just touch on that. Just, the singularity? <laughs> yes. Yes. As uh, as Terence discussed it around the time wave yeah. theory or the idea of singularity yeah. as such. Uh, I guess the uh, the idea of the singularity as such, I guess yeah, would be. Oh well, yeah. Well, the singularity, you know, the singularity in physics is is a you know is a concept, and it, it's in physics the singular. You know, this gets into space-time physics and black holes and this sort of <laughs> thing, but if you have a black hole, it's essentially, you know, there's an, uh, an event horizon, there's a so-called event horizon. Within the event horizon is the singularity, and the singularity is just a word for saying that physics cannot say anything about what's going on in there. You know, it's it's opaque to observation. It's opaque to measurement. So it's the singularity. It's They may as well say it's the black box. I mean, <laughs> that's essentially what they're saying. We don't know what is going on in that in that realm. The, the laws of physics don't apply. So we can say very little about it. On the other hand, the fact that we don't know what's going on in there means that almost anything could be going is on possible. In yes, there. right, and that's what's what's fascinating about it, you know. And when it comes to the mind and consciousness and all this, I mean, I I don't know. I I have a I have a a model that I like. I don't know if it applies or if it has scientific validity, but, you know, black holes are something that happens, and singularities are something that happens when you get a certain amount, a critical amount of mass compressed into a small enough area, right? Then it distorts space-time, and space-time essentially wraps itself around it. Even light can't escape then you get a singularity. But maybe an analogy is, I, I sometimes speculated, you know, the brain is the most complex object in the universe. And maybe when you get enough complexity stuffed together into a small enough area, like the cranium, maybe you get some kind of a singularity, a, a biological singularity of some kind. I mean, this is... This is Totally wild speculation, but you know I like the idea. So <clears throat> I don't know. As a That's physician, you you really have to walk a fine line, don't you? Uh, you do, right? Right, you definitely do. <laughs> I am. I mean, I hear you going right down that line. <laughs> <laughs> well, otherwise they'd say I was nuts. Yes, right? they would. Uh, they, <laughs> right. they would, and don't rule it out. Um, <laughs> all right, uh, let's go to Lipska. Is that right on Skype? Yes. Hello. Hello, I, Okay, you're not very loud, so you're going to have to get closer to your microphone or something. Is this better? Uh, can you get? Well, I don't know. What are you on? I'm on a Skype on a, on a smartphone. Okay. All right. Uh, are you using Bluetooth? No. Okay, well, go ahead. I'll, I'll try to be as loud as I can. I'll okay. take my answer off the air. Okay, sure. I wanted to ask the your up. opinion. Are um, people who, who sniff things like uh, um, spray paint, would that have the same effect as psychedelic drugs? <laughs> oh. No, afraid not. That's going to be an easy answer. Gee. Yeah, no, you're not going to, you're not going to get the same effect. You know, those things, uh, you know, psychedelic drugs <laughs> interact specifically with serotonin receptors, sometimes other receptors in the body. Uh, the, the solvents, the inhalants, those sorts of things, they're nonspecific. They don't interact with any receptors. What they essentially do is dissolve uh, nerve membranes. Uh, they totally disorganize it. And, you know, as a result... Uh, your your neural transmission is screwed up. Uh, you I don't. Uh, you know, it's these things should not be taken. These are 
quite no. harmful. No. Yes. Uh, to uh, the liver, among other things. Uh, all kinds. Yeah, I, of... I don't recommend that. That's not the way to go for altered states. There are much better ways to go. <laughs> <laughs> More ways than one. Oh, my. Um, okay. First time caller line. You're on the air with Dr. McKenna. Hello. First time caller line going once. Going twice. Gone like the wind. Um, hello there on the uh, phone line. You're on the air. Hi, can you hear me? I hear you. Great. Uh, thanks for taking my call. You're welcome. Uh, doctor, I have one question for you. Throughout the show tonight, you have mentioned several times about uh, basically personification of DMT and ayahuasca and warrants of psilocybin. Now, my question to you, doctor, is do you believe that there is a spirit or some sort of intelligence? <laughs> um, behind all right, well, these things? Yeah, here we're headed down that line again. Right, well, yeah, and I'm headed down the uh, down the same line where I'm, you know, I'm going to hedge my bets. I mean, again, I think people do experience these things, and they, you know, for this, they experience them as being real. I have done that, and most people who have had psychedelic experiences have done that. Uh, but what do you mean by real? <laughs> That's the problem. We, See, because we live in this... In well, this he, he, I think he was asking whether up. whether you're encountering an intelligence. Which appears not to be you. That's but, right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. But... but is it real? Well, as I say, you experience it as real. So, uh, uh, uh. you know, for though for practical purposes, the rest is just sort of metaphysical, you know, nitpicking in some ways. Uh, you know, I mean, it's for it's for uh, you know, perhaps it's not useful in a certain way to speculate on this, but it's always good to keep your mind open to say, well, well man, maybe, it, this, maybe what I'm experiencing is, is, a, is a piece of myself. There, listen, I, I, know like I know it is difficult. I know it is difficult for you, doctor, to speculate on this, but it is inevitably the first question somebody back from this experience is asking themselves. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. Okay, and it's remarkable how similar some of these alien or entity encounters are. Yes, I mean there is a whole universe, a whole phenomenology of pantheon of these things, if you like. Yes, I mean I, I, if people aren't familiar with it, I suggest they click into uh, this interesting website called uh, DMT Nexus. I think it's DMTNexus.com. Okay. Uh, it's fairly heavily science. There's a lot of ethnobotany, a lot of chemistry, and so on. But there are active conversations about this very topic, you know, and I mean, ranging from people who say, well, it's not real, to people who say, well, not only is it real, mm -hmm. you know, but we need to open an embassy in hyperspace. <laughs> I mean, you know, they're, they're an on embassy. That side. So, All right. So okay. Uh, let, let, <laughs> let's go to uh, Lorraine, Ohio, I believe. Hello. Hello, Art. Yes, hi. Hey, this is Matt. Thanks for having me on. This is another iconic evening. Uh, it is a, uh, you're a first time caller, right? I am, indeed. Okay, glad to have you. What's up? Big, big time fan. I have a question for Dennis. I've been experimenting with a number of these substances that you've been speaking about tonight for a little over 15 years, specifically around live music experiences. Um, I'm wondering what kind of insight you could, if you talk to people, what experience you have as to what is going on on some of these stages, because I've, I've seen the machines, I've seen all kinds of madness. I'm a student <laughs> of it, and I'm just wondering what your insight is about that scene. Thank you. Uh, so he's talking about the the live live music stages and that sort of thing. I mean, there is a, you know, there are, uh, you know, I'm surprised to see this because uh, I didn't really know it, but apparently there is a whole genre of music that is related to DMT. And uh, uh, there is a subculture around this. Uh, to be honest, I'm not in that involved in this. I mean, I'm kind of outside that 
too old, you know, but, but it is active. And, and actually I'd like to, uh, I'd like to plug somebody else's book here, which sure. is just about to come out. How unusual. It's by a gentleman named, uh, Graham St. John. And, uh, it's called, uh, Mystery School in Hyperspace, a cultural history of DMT. And, uh, I read it. I, he asked me to write the foreword for it and I did. And, uh, it's uh, it's a very interesting book. I suggest he get it. It talks about all of these, the, the kind of movements in art and music and the way that DMT has really influenced our culture. You know, And there's more than you might think. I mean, that's what surprised me. It actually has been around since the 50s and in the culture in some ways. And it's, it's having an effect. And now, of course, it, its effect is... Accelerating because people are more aware of it, then there's a lot of interest in it. So uh, it's a great book, Mystery School in Hyperspace. I think it's just about to come out, if not already out. All right. Well, consider it plugged. Uh, yeah. <laughs> hi there. You're on the air with uh, Dennis. Hello. Hello. Hi. Um, I was asking a question about methamphetamines. In 1983, I kind of went crazy and went used methamphetamines for, from April till September, practically daily. And the thing about addiction to it, when I decided to quit, I just cold turkey quit, never used it, haven't used it since. All right, well, that, that is interesting. Uh, and perhaps um, the doctor who has studied this sort of thing can explain this. Most people... Um, get hooked on something like meth, meth uh, they're hooked, and that's all there is to it. But there are occasionally people who can just decide to stop something, and without effort and without apparent consequence, they just stop. Doctor? Well, that's right. I mean, again, here you're looking at the... At the, at the, uh, at the biochemistry of individuality in a certain sense. Everybody is a biochemically unique individual and mm -hmm. and the way they respond to drugs of all kinds is determined by what's called their pharmacogenetics it's a big word which basically is you know the the part of your genome that's involved with metabolizing drugs and toxins that's your pharmacogenetics and Everybody, you know, some people can use something like heroin or, or nicotine or methamphetamine and fairly regularly and not really get addicted, you know. And other people, one or two exposures and they're quite hooked, you know. So there's a big, uh, there's a big psychological element to this and there's also a biochemical determinant. And it comes down to this. He, she just may be one of these people that is not particularly uh, prone to addiction. And she, she took the drug and had the drug, but never became hooked. I mean, this this is not unheard of. This goes on. I, I do understand that. I, I'm just amazed. I mean, I, I'm hooked on nicotine. I smoked uh, all my adult life. I have now quit, and I, I'm, I'm still hooked on nicotine. You know, I've got to chew or I've got to patch. I've got to have right. a little lozenge or something. I've got to have nicotine. So... Mm -hmm. I, in my wildest imagination, I can't imagine people get hooked and then just walk away, sort of without consequence. It's all, it's all about your sensitivity to these things. I guess so. Right? I guess. Like I, I was a long-term smoker for a long time. I smoked a pipe, so maybe I wasn't so prone to it. But one day, I just basically quit, and I never really smoked it regularly but the thing is for me when I get into a situation where people are smoking you know I'll bum a cigarette I'll smoke cigarettes <laughs> but when I walk away from that I don't have any craving so I'm one of these people that I can do it but I I don't get I don't get hooked you know knock on wood right I mean hopefully this will continue but I, I seem wow. to be not really I can enjoy it and yet I'm not dependent on it. To me that just describes how different we really are. Um let's yeah. go to uh, our first time caller line. You're on the air. Hello. Hello? Yes, hi. Oh, all right. Yes. Yeah. Uh listen, you you guess mentioned the ear brain connection modeling reality for you. That absolutely is a medical science proven fact. I mean it's uh called psychoacoustics and it was uh 
if you, for example, if you have something, a sound in Monoro coming at you, and your two speakers set in stereo separated, and you delay one speaker by like a millisecond, the speaker disappears. I mean, as far acoustically, it's you see the meters move, but nothing's coming out. Mm. And what mm-hmm. happens is the sound on your other ear is intensified. This mm-hmm. is so that if somebody's like throwing a rock or something's coming at you, you get uh, some sort of survival uh, uh, protection of some kind in signaling. Mm. You know, that's what they feel. There's a there's a lot of these events. So mm-hmm. modeling of reality is uh, is is scientifically sound. Now, the question is, when you take uh, something that creates distortion, is it, you know, connecting you to some new receivers, or is it just fooling with the uh, modulation? Yes. But it's absolute well, sound. It's yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard to say, but but that's that's absolutely right. I mean, you know, it's a it's a rule of thumb in science, you know, that if you have a system and you want to understand how it works, one thing you can do is you can you can muck with it. You can do something that interferes with the way mm-hmm. it works. You could look at it this way. And by making it go off track, like, for example, maybe taking a psychedelic is to interfere with normal functions, normal mm-hmm. consciousness. But by seeing what happens when you perturb that system in ways that you didn't before, you can understand things about how it works. And that's that's a common way to investigate phenomena. That's why, you know, that's why these drugs are so powerful for really understanding consciousness. Essentially, it's a, you know, if you look at Franz Wollenweider's work in, in Zurich, he's one of our hefter researchers and really a star in the field. He really uses psychedelics, especially psilocybin, in his patients you know, to study basically neuro neuroscience. How do we perceive lights and, and sounds and, and other kinds types of input and how do we take all that and synthesize it into something coherent because which we experience. This is what the brain does. You know, it takes the raw data of experience, it mixes it with internal processing and associations and all this. Somehow it extrudes, you can say it, think of it that way, it extrudes this thing called consciousness. And consciousness makes sense. Consciousness is something we're, that we're immersed in and we, and it makes sense to us most of the time. And this is what the brain does. And uh, so we can use psychedelics to study, well, what if we, you know, inject that, you know, put this drug into the mix? How does that right. change it and what can we learn from that? So it's interesting also that the caller mentioned psychoacoustics because now uh, people are working with the, like sound meditation and this kind of thing using acoustics in conjunction with psychedelics to cause profoundly altered states that can really give some insights into you know the limits of consciousness how the brain works also used in healing and that sort of thing. right okay so has, has there been any brain. scientific evidence that uh, acoustics in combination with psychedelics uh, light up even further or different sections of the brain it's a good question Yes, and there is scientific evidence. If you look at uh, the EEGs of people who are, you know, having these types of sound therapy experiences, they're quite remarkable. I mean, I I'm not qualified to interpret them, but they're, you know, they're they're pretty amazing. These are quite anomalous, uh, you know, electrical brain states that these things that these things cause. So that's a whole area, you know, and, and, and it's interesting that, you know, it goes back to really pretty ancient technologies. I mean, uh, you know, indigenous people, ancient civilization and all this stuff have often known of, they've known of a long time for of the power of sound, you know, in combination with uh, with some of these things, or just by themselves, they can certainly induce altered states. So that's a whole area that is fascinating and is just beginning to emerge. All right, uh, Professor, hold on a moment, and uh, we'll get back to you. Uh, we're coming up on a break, so let me use the opportunity to say 
Our public number is area code 952-225-5278. That's 952-225-5278. The first-time caller line is area code 775-285-5800. Did you get that? I did forget to mention it. I brought this up, uh, I think, during a open line show and then forgot to mention it again. But we do have it. Area code 775-285-5800. And with that, uh, my guest is Dr. Dennis McKenna. We're talking about a pretty sensitive subject. Uh, if you want to join in, got a comment, got a question, here we are. Strike 12, and Midnight in the Desert is pounding packets your way on the Dark Matter Digital Network. To call the show, please direct your finger digits to dial 1-952-225-5278. That's 1-952-CALL-ART. Here's a kind of an interesting comment from an ER nurse in Arizona. She says, um, as a nurse, I really thought I was not going to enjoy the show, but I must say it's very Interesting. I would say the same. Good uh, evening, or morning, or afternoon, whatever it is, wherever you are. Uh, Dr. Dennis McKenna is my guest, and we are discussing um, those drugs. <laughs> those uh, those drugs. Hello there. You're on the air with uh, Dr. McKenna. Hi. Uh, hi, Art. Hi, hi, Dennis. I uh, was wondering. Uh, I want, I have my my question was concerning uh, nitrous oxide, and <laughs> it seems to be making a big comeback uh, lately. And <clears throat> some people, some of my friends, and consider it a psychedelic in some ways, and, and it can seem to enhance uh, the effect of psychedelics. I was wondering what why you thought that was, why you think it's so addictive, and what do you think about the current government regulations and controls over it. Doctor? Hmm. Um, well, we may or may not get any input from the doctor. I, I, are you there, Dennis? Dennis McKenna? Um, he doesn't seem to be there, or we've lost connection with him, caller, so I'm not sure what to tell you. Uh, he's still, he's still here. I believe he's still here. Might just be away from the microphone or something. I don't know. Dr. McKenna. Paging Dr. McKenna. Uh, Dr. McKenna, I'm going to disconnect and uh, try calling you back. We apparently have some sort of, uh, uh, well, I can't call him back. All right. You know what? Um, if, I, if I can't call him back, then uh, we might as well go ahead and do essentially open lines. Um, we're in a situation where I guess the... I keep hearing it kind of thing uh, where the connection between us has dissolved. And uh, there is Dr. McKenna. Well, you may be in luck. Um, hello, Dr. McKenna. Yes. Can what happened? Hear me now? Yes. Yes. I don't know. We dropped the signal somehow. Well, that's Skype for you. Yeah. But <laughs> here we are. Um, um, did you hear the question, perchance? Uh, could you repeat it? Uh, the caller could. Uh, he hello, caller. Hello, caller. Are you still there? They've, they've I, given I, up. Yeah, I guess they've given up. Let's go to the next caller. I think Sorry uh, about that. That's all right. That's quite all right. It happens. New Haven, Connecticut. Hello, you're on the air. Hello. Hi. Hi, how you doing? Doing great. Hey. Hey. Uh, <laughs> listen, uh, I, I kind of just uh, broke into your show a minute or two ago, and uh, I hear you talking about the psychedelics. Uh, I'm 42 years old. Back in my early 20s, I used to uh, 
partake in some uh, psychedelics. Uh, I, I used to take a thing called uh, mescaline. Does that oh, make yes. Any sense to yes. You? Mushrooms, yes. Mm. Peyote. No, cactus. it was a yeah. little. It was a little tiny pill. Some people called it a microdot, and the other people yes. called it mescaline. I don't know what the difference is. Okay. Well, but um, I was able to, and then, quite frankly, some of my friends, uh, the guys that I used to, the friends that I hung out with, that when when they we would we would take these, the uh, they would have uh, some people. They just laughed and had a good time. I found out that by taking this drug, for lack of a better phrase. I could actually hear other people's thoughts. Does that make any sense at all? I guess it does. In, in other words, you thought you were hearing other other people's thoughts. Uh, my question would be, did you prove that you could hear other people's thoughts? I actually did. I actually did. Um, I thought I was hearing other people's thoughts, and I thought I was going out of my mind. So uh, I went to my – we were – it was there was a few people around, and I went to my friend, who also was on the same uh, same thing, and I put my back to his back. Yes. And I was able to see what he was seeing, and he could see what I was seeing, and I confirmed this by asking him verbally, "What are you looking at right now?" And he said, "I'm looking at the street lights." But the street lights were not facing him. He was facing the house, and I was looking at the house. Hmm. <laughs> well, these uh, things happen. Yeah. You know, I mean, they do happen on psychedelics. That's part of what makes them makes them uh, fascinating. Now, what's happened? Why do we have an echo here? I I don't know. Uh, I haven't changed a thing here. I have not either, but I'm hearing an echo. I wonder if you're still on the, uh, uh, perhaps uh, you changed away from the microphone on your headset. Yeah, I'm checking that now. Input, output. That, that would be my guess. That's all. It looks like it's inputting, outputting the right way. Okay. Uh, well, as you mentioned, that's Skype for you. Uh, let's, yeah. you know what, we might have the caller back, uh, that first time caller. Are, are you there? Hi, yes. Okay, good. Hi. Hi, Dennis. Yeah. Um, glad I had a chance to speak with you. Um, uh, I have a question concerning nitrous oxide, and it has been making a big comeback um, lately, and also some people consider it to be very similar to a psychedelic, right. and it can be used to enhance the effect of a psychedelic in many cases. Um, and I'm wondering um, why does it do that, and why is it so addictive uh, as far as people just liking to do it so much and why does it uh what do you think about the current government regulations and controls over it and should they yeah. be the way that they are or, or lose it i i remember the question now and uh, i don't know what i'm going to do about this echo but anyway uh it's it's not really addictive people like to do it Right, that that's different. So people like to do it. It's not really addictive, and it's not really a psychedelic either. It works by a completely different mechanism, but it does seem to uh, enhance the effects of of psychedelics. Some people say it does. Probably part of it is it it, it causes hypoxia. It causes uh, a uh, you know a lack of oxygen in the brain, and if you hold your breath. It, you know, that will induce an altered state. So that's part of it. It's the psychedelic plus the hypoxia. Um, and, you know, people say it enhances it. I've never found that it made much difference, but I haven't experimented with it a lot. Um, medically, it's a medically used gas. It's important. I mean, it's used in dentistry, right? It's used as a kind of anesthetic. Uh, so it's a medically regulated product. Um, and in that sense, it's government regulated, but you know it's freely available. I think it's fairly harmless. He also asked about what you were feeling about the continued illegality of it. Well, I wasn't aware it was illegal. Uh, is nitrous oxide illegal? Caller, 
Caller? So, 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 hello? Yes, yes. Yes, it, it is. Yes. Okay. It's more in some places. Like, yes, than so. heroin in some places. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, you know, like like everything else, like I said before, I don't really think prohibition is a solution. I think that, you know, there's millions of substances out there which which alters alter a state. So, you know, I think that people need to be educated how to use these substances. And, and if you choose to use nitrous oxide, yeah, I can think of a lot worse, worse choices in that sense. I suppose. You know, I mean, it's not so bad compared to other things, you know, methamphetamine, heroin, these sorts of things. Why do you think the government, uh, just sort of as a question here, took virtually all drugs um, or most drugs and made them illegal with a couple of notable uh, exceptions tobacco uh, coffee and alcohol well uh, it didn't happen overnight I mean it, it happened really sort of from the start of the the end of the 19th century you know it happened because there were all these drugs like cocaine and, and opiates mostly uh, that were getting used, getting incorporated into what amounted to, uh, uh, you know, nostrums, uh, home remedies, like, like home remedies. People could buy sure. tincture of opium. They could buy remedies for sleep that contained opium. They could sure. buy things that contain cocaine, yes. you know, coca wine, all this stuff. So these drugs are fairly e- hard to, you know, they're easy to abuse, right? They're easy to get hooked on. So there was alarm that people were getting hooked on these. So that was really the genesis of the FDA at the beginning of the 19th century was an attempt to, you know, first regulate and eventually prohibit these things. So it evolved over time. You know, I mean, the worst instance was prohibition, you know, was Mm -hmm. a good example. And if we didn't learn our lesson from that, then we tried to prohibit alcohol, which probably is one of the worst drugs. It's very, very dangerous, very bad for you. Didn't work, right? So they repealed prohibition. They didn't repeal the prohibition on some of these other substances, but that's obviously not working either. So, I don't know. We, as a, as a culture, we have a very, uh, you know, sort of uncomfortable relationship with, uh, you know, with these drugs. And, and in our culture, there's too much effort. I mean, I, I tell my students sometimes, you know, to shock them. I say, you know, there's no such thing as a bad drug, mm-hmm. right? And that's true because it's not the drugs that are bad. It's the way they're used, right? So that's when it, where that comes down to human behavior. That comes bad. There's lots of bad ways to use drugs, right? But yes. there's no such thing as a bad drug. The badness in here is in the, in the way people use them. You know, you could take that exact argument, transfer it to guns. Well, yeah. There's no such thing. I mean, guns in themselves are not inherently bad, bad but how they're used. certainly use them in bad ways. I mean, if you're talking about a moral dimension, I think, with respect to drugs, guns, all these things, moral dimension applies to human behavior, right? So this is what we have to look at if we're going to invoke morality. Is it moral to take drugs or is it is it moral to you know use firearms or in what in what situation is there a moral way to use firearms a moral way to use drugs yes probably lots of uh, not so positive ways to use them but it all comes down to human behavior mm-hmm. this is what we've got to focus on not the prohibition of the the drug or the gun ultimately that's not going to work all right, there's yeah, a lot of people, people waiting people for you. How use these things? They're dangerous. Doctor, a lot of people want to talk to you. Uh, New Haven, Connecticut, yeah. very quickly for Dr. McKenna. Hey, I'm back. I'm sorry. Uh, somehow my phone got cut off. Okay. And your question okay. is? Uh, it was the question. It was the statement that I was asking about uh, if it made sense that we were able to, um, uh, I was able to, See what he was seeing. He's able to see what I was. Oh, seeing. Uh, okay. Well, that, that that got answered. All I can okay, tell you now, is to go, to go to go along with that. Um, there was a gentleman, uh, a CIA agent, who they were 
Uh, back in the 60s, they were doing experiments. The CIA was doing experiments on their own people. MK Ultra. Yep. You, M- MK Ultra. Right. So, okay. They say he committed suicide, but uh, they found that uh, he had a bump on the head. Mm-hmm. And uh, you, you know the story I'm talking about? Yes, I think we do. Uh, yeah, there uh, are several stories. Yeah, I mean, the CIA, well, as we were talking about a moment of, a moment ago, talk about the immoral use mm-hmm. of psychedelic drugs. There would be one. They were pretty much immoral, you know. I mean, they were using it for mind control or whatever, but but the immoral part really was that they were giving these drugs to people without their knowledge, which I think is... Very immoral. Really immoral, actually. <laughs> okay, Anchorage, uh, Alaska, you're on the air with Dr. McKenna. Yeah, Art? Yes. All right. First, first of all, thank you very much for your show. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonderful show, and I'd like to make a statement and pose a question. And my statement is this reminds me of a movie that used to be called Altered States, which was done by <laughs> deprivation and, and uh, drugs. But when you mention the chemical compounds, my mind goes to the, the structure of atomic structures, the nucleus, and breaking through whole new dimensions. So my mind can't wrap around the, if you walk this out where it goes because you seem to be implying chemical connections to the wonders of it all. So my question to you is this, that earlier you mentioned that you've been doing this for four years, and I wonder if it's appropriate. Forty years. Four, Forty years, caller. Forty years. Yes, four yeah. years. Can you? No, no, caller. Forty years. Forty. Oh, 40. I'm sorry. Well, if it's appropriate, can you explain to us uh, your your doses and how often you've taken it and your mission so that we might understand? It is, I'm not sure this is the appropriate thing to ask you, but you're such a great communicator. Maybe you could share with us your, your journey to understand what it is and why you're doing it. Now, get off it. It's a great show, Art. All right. Thank you. Well, Doctor. thanks. Um, no, I'm not going to go into details, really. I, I just, uh, I mean, it would be boring to most people. Um, all I'll say is that I have learned from psychedelic drugs a lot. I have been involved with them for over 40 years, and I've learned, you know, I, I, again, in the, in the model that these things are teachers, right, plant teachers. I guess my major teachers have been mushrooms and ayahuasca. And more lately, it's been ayahuasca. But, you know, how a person uses them, how often, I mean, everybody's relationship with these things is different, right? Just like everybody's, you know, you have a friendship with a person and it's not the same that I might have with that same person. So, so it's unique, you know, and, uh, all I can say is I'm, I feel like I've learned from them. And, uh, you know, I'm grateful for that. And, uh, you know, if there's a take home lesson, people say, well, you've been taking these things for 40 years. What have you learned? <laughs> and the, 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 the truth is what I've learned is that we don't know much. <laughs> you know, I don't know much. Nobody knows much. And so that's a kind of, I mean, that's, You'd think you'd have more to say, but that's that's my take-home lesson. Be humble about how little you really know about this world, about this universe, and it's a marvelous place, and it, we only understand a very tiny part of it. So it that, is, and that's it, what drugs have taught me. Doctor, um, and that's a great place to end it because we have to end it. The show is ending. So, All right. Um, anything you want to plug, plug it now. Brotherhood of the Screaming Abyss, my book. Uh, it's on Amazon.com or it's from the website of the same name. I have a lot of these books, so please buy one if you're interested in my story. Uh, thanks, Art, for being such a great host. We we barely scratched the surface, so I hope oh, you'll I have me back one of these I days. I will. Uh, doctor, thank you so very much. I appreciate it so much. Thank you. Have a great night. Indeed, Brotherhood of the Screaming Abyss. What a great title. My Life with Terrence McKenna. Dennis McKenna, Dr. Dennis McKenna was our guest. And uh, what a great show. So, listen, everybody, thank you. We'll do it again tomorrow. And for those left on the line, I'm sorry uh, we didn't get to you. But there's almost, well, not almost. There just is not enough time in a show to get to everybody. So I'm sorry you got left in the lurch. Good night. Good night.